Hey everyone, uh, thank you for attending my session on uh, growing uh, mature products. Uh, before we begin, uh, let me try and you know introduce myself. I'm Dev, and I'm currently uh, working as a chief product officer with Urban. Uh, here I lead uh, the engineering and the product teams to build uh, convenient and high quality wellness services to be availed at home by the consumers. And I've been here for the last nine months now. Uh, my product journey began uh, a few years back, about seven or eight years back when I started working with Uber. And uh, we were focused on building engagement and transition products for our supply. Uh, that is how I got interested in product and I loved it. And then throughout those two, two and a half years where I worked with Uber, product is something that, that interested me as well as intrigued me a lot. And that made me kind of go deeper into the product side of things. Uh, followed by Uber, I joined a company called Kareem. Uh, it is based out of the MENA region and it's headquartered in Dubai. And um, this company, I mean, I started in Kareem as a competition to Uber, but then Uber ended up buying Kareem. And I eventually came back into the fold of uh, Uber. I, in Kareem, uh, I, was, I was looking on the other side of supply, which is the the new supply, which is everything that is everything that's got to do with uh, acquiring new supply. And I spent a few months there uh, before realizing that uh, maybe it's time to kind of build products from the scratch. And that is when I kind of got myself involved with the, the new categories where we were trying to discover uh, new subcategories, which can be kind of built into full-fledged product, uh, you know, on the ride hailing side of the business. And that is something I think we will talk uh, in, in our next uh, 30 minutes, wherein we discuss mature products and how to kind of, uh, you know, discover new uh, sub-user, uh, you know, use cases and kind of lead the discovery uh, on that front. Ultimately, you know, being able to build full-fledged products that takes care of those user problems or needs. Um, so uh, post Kareem, I, I uh, came here in London and I started working with Deliveroo. Uh, I spent about a year on on search functionality of Deliveroo, which means like the whole global search that you see on websites, on apps, on menu pages, on home pages, and elsewhere. And before diving into a, a much more broader role of that of chief product officer. So that was me. Uh, and without wasting any further time, uh, let's just try and discuss this topic and do let me know, I mean, at the end of this discussion, how it went and what are your thoughts in terms of comments uh, below the video. All right, so let's begin. All right, then. So, uh, yeah, so let's talk about the product life cycle. Now, uh, you might have seen this graph before, right? I mean, it is not just associated with digital products, but with, you know, uh, physical products as well. And this is basically the graph of uh, diminishing returns you might have studied in under different context uh, since your childhood, right? So uh, the same graph kind of same curve applies for uh, product life cycle, regardless of what kind of product it is. And it starts right from the development stage. Now, I looked through some other curves online and found this one to be the most relevant um, uh, because I think what this curve does versus some of the other curves is that it kind of you know starts a little lower on the y-axis, which is the, the time and the resources spent towards development. So during the development stages, I mean, you are in your um, R&D, right which means that you are consuming a lot of resources and you are spending a lot of money without actually contributing to anything on the revenue side or on the value side and hence the curve starts on the negative during the development phase this is also the time you are kind of doing a lot of research this is like primary research secondary research 
And then this is the time you're doing a lot of, you know, all your findings that then benchmarked with uh, the competition. And this is where you also do competition analysis, you know, prototype testing, prototype design, and so on. So all those things are combined together into the R&D, which goes into the development of the product. And so the point where you are done with this is where you kind of launch the product. And this is where you kind of introduce the product to your user base. And when you launch, you'll typically launch with a minimum viable product or an MVP to begin with. And uh, you take this product to the market, to your users, hoping that this would kind of solve some of the user problems, uh, you know, to, to begin with. And this is also where you kind of market the product. And that is the introduction phase. And this is where the product starts, you know, uh, reaching to your larger user base and tries to solve problem. And this is where it st slowly starts contributing positive revenue. This is this means that you are you're selling the product and and the point where your product actually, uh, you know, uh, is able to provide that exact value to the users, which is essentially the product market fit is the time when the growth, uh, you know, hits the product. And this is where you see a rapid uptake. This is where you see your sales numbers, your GMVs or GTVs, your gross bookings, all those numbers that the top line metrics of revenue uh, start hitting the roof. And this is where you realize that your product has actually been a fit to the market. All, all the research that you that went into it and understanding like what the user needs were and how the numbers look like are actually coming to uh, you know fruition. And uh, that is where your whole uh, you know uh, growth is happening. So these are the first three stages of product life cycle and post this stage after some time at the growth stage is where your product enters into uh, maturity and saturation and to speak more about this i mean i'll just move to the next slide Yeah, so when, when it hits the maturity and saturation, uh, uh, yeah, so let's talk about what's a mature product. I mean, uh, you've heard about the first three stages, right? Uh, so it's simple. I mean, you know that a product is in maturity when it has ceased to grow. I mean, the top line numbers of revenue are not growing anymore. Uh, and, and then it kind of become flat and month after month, week after week, uh, you realize that there is no uh, growth in your revenue. So that's one of the first indicators that uh, your product has kind of entered into maturity, maturity I'm sorry. Um, and then the growth is going to be kind of saturated from here onwards. And one of the reasons why this is happening is because the benefits have mostly stagnated. I mean, it, there was a certain value proposition of your product for your consumers, for your users, right? And then it seems that uh, those benefits have kind of, you know, stagnated. I mean, you tried providing other value through your products, but somehow those values are, are kind of, you know, not finding a sync with your user problems. And as a result, the, the users who have been using your product has been more or less the same. And then that's the reason that you are not able to kind of grow the product. So how do you kind of know, uh, you know, identify um, uh, that a product is in kind of maturity? So one of the first indicators of such thing is when your consumer acquisition is kind of slowing. So new users are, are kind of increasingly hard to come by. Uh, again, like if, like month by month, week by week, you will realize that the new users that you are getting are are getting really tapered off, and very few users are entering the the top of the funnel, right? So, and you constantly look forward to your existing users to deliver that growth because because you see that the new users are are you know uh, are tapering off. They are becoming less with every passing week, every passing month. 
and there's increasing pressure on your existing users to kind of you know provide that growth now once the onus falls from new users to existing users you'll soon realize that within the existing users the only way that uh, that top line or revenue growth can come by is by increasing their you know average order value but sooner you will realize that the average order value coming out of existing users has also kind of become you know stagnant i mean so which essentially means that the the revenue growth that you are seeking uh, is no longer happening because uh, there are no new new users and the existing users are also not kind of spending any more you know and you also realize that now i mean now that there are no new users and the existing users are also spending a fixed amount of you know uh, you know value on your on your platform and they're not growing at all you start squabbling for for new users uh, you know from new or existing users perhaps from your competition so you try to kind of get the they get new users from your competition or you constantly ensure that your existing users don't churn away uh, you you focus on reengagement efforts and ensure that the the churn problem is solved which means that there's very few leakage from your bucket of existing users and if some of them have gone to the competition you ensure that you get them back uh, to yourself so the battle is now being fought be- between your competition and you know that the market has more or less saturated and there's no further users that will come in to kind of use your product and the last bit uh, which is again a great uh, indication is that this is when because all these things uh, are not leading to your revenue growth uh, you see that new market entrants have entered so these are these are essentially very small companies uh, who have just entered the market and you would initially think that these are small players they might not be able to make much of a difference but you soon realize that a, one of these small players or a combination of such small players is nibbling your market at the edges you know you're losing market share slowly by slowly uh, every month maybe the individual months might not be uh, you know uh, be able to indicate that but then when you look at a six month or a one year period you realize that maybe you have lost single digit percentage of the market to some of these new entrants so all these together kind of gives you a good indication that your product has mostly in in maturity and if not done something it might just move into the last stage which is that of decline some of the key indicators uh, that kind of point towards this is you know revenue cost profit market share you know engagement promoter score cancellation rate especially for companies like you know uber and kareem in ride hailing um are, are will kind of point you towards um um you know a product which is in the in the maturity part of their life cycle okay so what app options do you have i mean once uh you you kind of identify your product in the in the fourth uh part of the life cycle which is that of maturity so the first option is that of you know keeping the product in maturity so there's nothing wrong with product entering maturity i mean that's rather something to be kind of sort of proud of right i mean it kind of went through all these stages it had a great product market fit and that's why um, you know it saw the growth that it saw and now it is in maturity so one of the options is to kind of keep it in maturity maintain it in maturity and prolong the the fourth part of the cycle for as long as possible uh, before it kind of hits into decline so one of the ways to kind of do that to keep your product in maturity is uh you know i mean uh, protect your uh, product's position uh, without investing as little resources as possible which means both in terms of time and money like let it run by itself in more of an auto mode kind of a thing without you spending any additional time and resources and money towards you know i mean uh you know towards your product and instead you kind of use this time and uh you know money these set of resources for something else you know maybe for discovery of a new product but let you spend very minimal uh, amount of resources on your product at this stage and most of your limited resources are spent towards uh you know either providing bug fixes or providing like you know building incremental uh, enhancements or features to your current product i mean 
Um, so I think uh, that's a good way of like, you know, keep holding the product where it is, uh, you know, rather than, you know, doing some big bang changes to your product. So what's working, you just let it work. Um, and you just look at maybe they could have uh, features, uh, you know, in your uh, product roadmap and maybe use some of those, uh, you know, build some of those now, which constantly got, you know, pushed to later and later stages. Maybe now is the time to kind of build some of those. And if those do not have much value in your prioritization, then maybe like maybe fixing a couple of, uh, you know, bugs would help at this stage. And in turn, I mean, when you spend less resources and just focus on the the fringe, uh, you know, fixes, uh, you what you allow is to kind of, you know, turn the product into a cash cow kind of a thing, because obviously you are spending very less resources there. So the cost side of things remain less, whereas obviously because the product has hit a certain amount of growth, if you play around with pricing, maybe you ultimately have a product which is that of a cash cow which constantly gives you uh which which is unit positive which gives you revenue and it is a profitable product and the fact that you have spent very little uh you know uh, you know resources cost wise uh, on the product has ensured that it's kind of you know giving you returns and you you kind of let the product uh, provide returns and with, without you know investing too much. I mean, so investment side of things uh, remains moderate to low, whereas the return from that investment remains high. And as a result, I mean, you have a great ROI on the product. So that's one option that you have. Um, the other option that you have is kind of, you know, stretching the, the product into the growth stage. So while you saw the previous graph wherein the maturity stage was kind of stretched, here, uh, once you identify the product into the maturity stage, you 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 behave as if uh, you are still in your growth stage, and you constantly kind of you know push the product towards uh, growth even during your maturity stage. So one of the ways of doing that is to constantly run a product discovery exercise um, in the maturity stage. So for instance, like you can perhaps, you know, enhance the cap capabilities and uh, new features to your, your core product. So think about an iPhone, right? I mean, uh, we saw that the iPhone came in lot, a, a long time back and then the iPhone that came in first uh, is, is drastically different from what you have in the market right now. I mean, the iPhones got bigger, uh, you know, they have way more features than what you had in say iPhone 6 or even before, um, it, you have like some great uh, camera capabilities uh, in iPhone right now and like photo taking capabilities and photo editing and so on and so forth has got, uh, you know, largely enhanced. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, so a lot of whole, whole lot of like apps have come in. So what, what iPhone has done is like, it never allowed uh, its core product of uh, iPhones here. Uh, to kind of reach into that maturity stage and eventually getting into decline. But they took that opportunity to kind of constantly innovate and, you know, you know, build capabilities and features on top of their existing product. So much so that the iPhone today looks absolutely different and absolutely, uh, you know, robust compared to what you had before. So that's one of the options that you can do to kind of stretch your growth stage. The, the second thing that you can do is take your existing mature product into a, a new market or a fresh market and attract a whole bunch of, you know, new users. So one of the ways to do that is to kind of, you know, look at new use cases. Uh, one of the one of my favorite examples here is like YouTube kind of catered to uh, consumers need for, uh, you know, audio visual content, but the audio and visual vid video kind of played simultaneously. So YouTube realized that and felt that how do it, does it address the needs of uh, those users who are looking for just audio content, particularly music, right? I mean, they're going towards Spotify. I mean, how can they leverage their existing product and build something that can kind of satisfy the needs of uh, the users who are looking at simply the audio content or just the music. So they, that's where they kind of came up with YT Music, where it is YouTube Music. 
uh, wherein they just hide the videos and let the users go through the whole audio. And they particularly do this for, uh, you know, music videos where they know that there's a use case of simply listening to the audio uh, without looking at the video. So that's like, you know, taking your existing product to a completely new market and leveraging your current capabilities to kind of build something for the new user base that you are targeting. So that's that's the second option that you have. The third one that you have is kind of bundling your product with other offerings. And one good example is that of Gmail. I mean, we have been using Gmail for, for a long time now, right? I mean, if you look at it, I mean, when Gmail came by, I mean, there were other players like Hotmail, Yahoo, and so on and so forth. But sooner, I think most users have realized that uh, what Google is doing is kind of stitching an ecosystem around each of its product, which makes them so integrated that uh, even if you try and use some other uh, you know, platform for mailing, there will be capabilities of Google that you are particularly going to miss. And that's how they kind of bundled all those products together. I mean, you have Google Meet working simultaneously with Gmail and a lot of other features like Drive and so on, which will get completely uh, devoid of if uh, you kind of just go with, with some other mail service. I'm not saying that users are not doing that, but then it's far like the capabilities of the ecosystem is far more enhanced than some of these individual products, which were kind of getting into the risk of, uh, you know, becoming touching maturity. But then obviously these companies have never allowed it to do so. So I think these are the three options that you have if you think that your product is in maturity, but you don't want to kind of keep it at a mature stage and eventually lead to its decline and rather push it further up. So how have some other companies have handled this? Uh, so let's look at the Coca-Cola example, right? I mean, it's one of the great examples. And also uh, just to point out, like I said in the beginning, uh, this is this is true not just for digital products, but uh, the whole range of products. Uh, Right. I mean, even even the physical ones. So Coca-Cola, I think we know the flagship product, which is that of the red soft drink pot bottle. Uh, now, that is something we all grew up with. And let's see, like how Coca-Cola tried and kind of deal with the mature product. I mean, what they did is kind of took um, a diversified strategy. They didn't know which one will work or perhaps they felt that they have a shot at all those, uh, you know, uh, different pronged uh, approaches. And that's the reason that they went through all these uh, approaches, perhaps simultaneously. Uh, so the first one being like, they started building new product lines, right? I mean, Coca-Cola launched a lot of, you know, other products alongside their cola, which is water, mineral water, you know, flavored water, green tea and stuff like that. So that's like building new product lines alongside. Uh, then the, what they did next is like they, they built variants to their existing Coca-Cola drink, which is the, the cherry one, the sublime Coke one, the vanilla one, and a couple of other ones. Uh, this is just so that they can enter into newer markets. I mean, um, there would be people like who would be looking for a taste change and uh, they would be trying out something else in the market. But now with such variants, I mean, you can always go and give these users a range of options and say that, hey, if you don't want cola, why don't you take like a cherry Coke or a vanilla Coke or something else? So th the base product in these is still Coke, but then there's a little bit of change in terms of taste and flavor. And the fourth, the third option, obviously, which you can take is stretch the growth stage of your existing product. So which means that um, like Coca-Cola has adjusted to uh, much more, uh, you know, health conscious audience um, and felt that they will lose out on those and they will completely stop using the cola products. And that's why they got into Diet Coke, Coke Zero and so on and constantly emphasized that these are the healthier ones with no sugar content. So like like many, many companies will perhaps focus on one or two, but Coca-Cola with all its, uh, you know, uh, all its might have, you know, tried uh, you know, working on a mature product in a, in a very, very multi-pronged approach. And they tried everything. Uh, most of these things seem to be working. 
I don't know which one's working and which one's not, but that's yet to be seen. But we see all these product and product lines out there in the market. Um, so it means that they are going, uh, you know, in, in, in a very, very uh, robust manner on, 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 you know, diversifying their uh, product portfolio. So um, this is a cool example. Now let's uh, look at how uh, we at Kareem uh, and also in Uber kind of tried ta tackling this this mature product problem. So if you think about Uber, I mean, uh, the, the right hailing service that you have is kind of their mature product, right? I mean, they, they introduced this service back in 2012 and initially I think uh, there was a great product market fit and that was how they launched city after city all throughout the world by saying that this is going to be an alternative to public transport as well as uh, private vehicle ownership and it will kind of be in the in the middle and then it will kind of provide better services to users at a lower price point and it is going to do that through price efficiencies but then if you look at it from 2012 till 2022 right now uh in this last 10 years it is sort of becoming mature i mean if you read through reports and i have been privy to uh, some of these and it gives me a sense that it's more mostly a mature product from a revenue standpoint so how did kareem uh you know uh, and Uber also, to an extent, tried to deal with such a mature product. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, even they took a multi-pronged strategy. I mean, pretty much similar to Coca-Cola. And that's the reason I perhaps thought that uh, uh, maybe we can just show the Coca-Cola example first. So what they did is like they launched new product lines. I mean, they were into mobility. They launched new product lines like food, groceries, quick groceries, bikes, mass transit, transit, etc. So completely different product lines, uh, you know, in general connected on the lines of mobility. Uh, so that's something they started with. Uh, they all, what they also did is they pushed the product in newer markets for premium riders, for big family, for environment conscious users and so on, like UberX, Black, Green, Excel, etc. The third thing they did pretty much again on the lines of what Coca-Cola did is stretch the growth stage of existing product. So what they did is uh, tweaked or adjusted their standard ride hailing service, wherein like you call for a driver and the driver arrives at you and then drops you to a certain place uh, with newer use cases like, you know, how does the product gets modified at high density locations? So just to explain what high density locations is, because I think the next couple of minutes will be on that. High density location refers to, uh, you know, uh, like train stations, airports, malls, uh, hospitals, or business arenas, uh, concert halls, and so on. Wherever you have too many people, too many uh, you know users jam packed in one square space, and we we have realized that the the standard uh, ride hailing service or product of whether it's Uber, Kareem, or some other player does not seem to work at such places, and as a result you will see that most of the drivers kind of avoid high density locations. Uh, if, if not for drop off, then definitely for pickup. Uh, and then similarly on the rider side, you will mostly notice riders going for, you know, standard city taxi services or street hail services at high density locations instead of going for, uh, you know, the standard Uber or Kareem service. I mean, imagine yourselves at the airport. I mean, do you always call an Uber or Kareem or do you also get tempted to kind of go with the city cab, which might be queued right in front of you? Uh, maybe not for, for multiple reasons, but you would perhaps admit that uh, hailing uh, one of these cab services, uh, you know, at maybe an airport or a, or a massive mega mall is always a little bit more difficult than calling them on a street or at your home. And second is uh, other, some of the other cases were intercity wherein go between one city to another. Some of those twin cities are connected by, uh, you know, caps, then rental services and so on. So like, like Coke, I think Kareem and Uber, their ride hailing services also at a certain stage of maturity. And maybe they are 
uh, you know, looking at a multi-pronged approach to kind of grow their service. So, um, like, like uh, you know, Coke, uh, even even uh, Uber and Kareem do not have a single answer, and they are trying their level best on in all the directions. So yeah, so uh, moving a little deeper. So what we did is we kind of started focusing on the on the high density locations use case. Uh, there were other use cases as well, but I think high density uh, uh, density locations is perhaps a great use case to kind of explain that what do you do to your mature product when you sense maturity, and how do you kind of discover these uh, sub uh, you know, uh, user segments um, and try to kind of solve their specific problems. So, uh, so what we did is like we ran a discovery pr process, and we realized that less than two percent of the total uh, mobility GMV comes from high density locations. Oh, just a second. I'll just move this. Less than two percent of yeah GMV comes from high density locations. And some of the reasons for that was that most of the trips to high density locations used to have the the lowest, uh, you know, NPS. I mean, whether you call up the driver and ask, ask them to fill up a form, same goes for the riders. I mean, you will always see loads of comments and loads of complaints from, uh, you know, both riders as well as drivers. And uh, that is one of the reasons which largely contributed to the abysmal percentage of, uh, you know, uh, total GMV that used to come from high density locations. The second thing that we realized again is that high density location trips were also the worst rated ones, uh, again, both from drivers and riders. So that was a second indicator. And then the third thing that we realized is most of these trips have, uh, you know, low trips per user which means that most of these uh, you know trips that happen to these high density locations are one off trips i mean it's not something you can connect as a pattern and the best part is like you will see that these trips are mostly taken from the city to the high density location but then the the other trip which is the equal and opposite trip from that place back to the city does not happen i mean you would see that the user has taken a ride from the city to the to the to the location and then the next trip happens somewhere from within the city to within the city a couple of days later, right? Or a couple of weeks later as well. So, so we realized that there's something missing at this point. Uh, clearly, I think users perhaps enjoy just the ride from their home or office space to one of these places, but they definitely don't enjoy the whole experience of riding from one of these high density locations and coming back. And this again contributed to this this low percentage of GMV that comes from high density locations. And, and then what we did is like, we mapped the whole city uh, and found out all the high density location. And these were not just airports, but malls, bus stations, you know, places of worship, hospitals, business arenas, uh, you know, concert halls and so on. And tried to Im imagine like what kind of uh, trips could happen from these places and what would be the approximate GMV. And we felt that the high density locations can add up to about 40% of the total mobility GMV. Um, and then that's a massive number. I mean, we looked at some of the other use cases, like I said, intercity, we looked at the sub use cases of, you know, how do we drop the users, the, the consumers, uh, you know, kids to uh, the 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 school and there are a couple of other use cases as well but then i think we just went ahead with this one because we felt that when you kind of try and grow a mature product the only way you can get that growth is by building a disruptive product and by by going with a use case that uh, that hits home the hardest that actually solves a lingering problem that the users have and that's where that's that is where you will have the next phase of growth. Whereas if you just go for incremental product improvements, you, you, you might get a little bit of more growth at that point of time, but it will mostly taper off and then move towards, you know, your product moving further into maturity. So that is the reason we kind of went forward with high density locations. Uh, 
so yeah so uh so yeah so next we we went a level deeper and tried to kind of uh look at some of those demand supply and you know marketplace metrics so most of the metrics that that we looked at uh were, were kind of done with secondary analysis and some of the things we find out some of the insights we got were that 70 percent of the drivers were actually leaving the airport um you know i mean without taking a trip back uh which ultimately led to even higher etas right i mean because the supply at such a crucial demand point shrunk and as a result and the ETS uh, did went up a lot, and this is startling, right? And it's quite counterintuitive. I mean, if you look at it, I mean, the drivers why would they come back, you know, empty-handed from a high-density location, and especially uh, airports which are mostly, uh, you know, out of the city, which means that they had quite a dry run. But they were rather, uh, you know, inclined to do that rather than staying at the airport to kind of pick up the next passenger. Uh, and then we also realized that drivers at uh, identity locations have more uh, cancellation compared to the the city average. And uh, when we kind of you know started speaking with the drivers just to understand that why this is happening, we realized that there's a huge uh, issue around you know coordination with the riders for pickup. And we ourselves have faced that right constantly saying you are on you are at pillar number this or you know uh, you know like like the specific place on the on the airport where you say that you stand and give all those references of gates and everything else so that you can help the uh, you know driver come and pick it up and then the rider the drivers face similar issues as well and there's uncertainty around um how much the the drivers have to wait uh, you know, before they receive the next booking, it sometimes could be like as quickly as say maybe a couple of minutes, it, but it can go up till hours and you don't know. And honestly, I mean, they don't know that whether in, they are in the peak time uh, in terms of the airport or is it like, uh, you know, they are at off peak time. So uh, that's that, that leads to a certain amount of uncertainty around the wait time. And the last bit that we realized on the supply side of things uh, is like there are parking challenges and indefinite wait times for you know pickup slot for for riders and most of these places I mean you would realize that they have this parking which is really far and then that is where most of the drivers wait and only a few of them come to the to the pickup slot because you have limited space in, in terms of the in 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 front of any of those gates. And uh, and so this whole cycle around parking and arriving at the at the gate just to find that their rider is not ready and then they're constantly hassled by cops and other security uh, assistants there to kind of you know leave that arena as quickly as possible to prevent congestion actually leads to all these issues. Similarly, on the demand side, we realize that the cancellation rate on the rider is fifty percent higher at high density locations compared to city average. Obviously, I mean, we can place ourselves again, uh, you know, in the rider shoes to kind of see that what those issues could be. And then I think the, our primary analysis uh, pointed to, uh, you know, uh, the same thing. The, some of the issues that you find at the airport is that that many of the users will not have either the app, Wi-Fi or smartphone. Like you have arrived into a new city, you have the smartphone, but you don't have the app. And you don't have a data connection as well. Sometimes, in most cases, the high density location uh, Wi-Fi doesn't work. Similarly, uh, you know, challenging it is sometimes challenging for the for the rider to kind of you know speak with the drivers. Some of the number plates are written in a different language, especially in this Middle East region. Um, and then sometimes uh, the drivers uh, of of the place where you have landed, I mean, do not speak the same language and that makes it even more difficult to communicate and coordinate. And then there are, of course, like higher ETS because most drivers are canceling their trips. And then uh, at the same time, I think the last issue is around unfamiliarity layout, around the layout of high density locations, because many of these places, I mean, you don't know how many levels there are, which level you are at, which gate you are in. I mean, sometimes you, you stand at a gate which is not accessible by uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, the private transport, the, the cabs and everything else. So, I mean, that leads to a lot of confusion 
and obviously you cannot coordinate well. And then there are like marketplace issues around ETS being extremely high, and that's because no attempt has been made in the in the standard, uh, you know, uh, product to kind of have a demand supply matching. Uh, there is no forecasting built into it, and as a result, uh, you know, the the marketplace algorithm doesn't work well. You would also realize that. You know, uh, there are no queuing mechanisms for high density locations because if you look at the the layout of such locations, you would realize that it is different from that of city. Like while in a in a, in a city, both the demand and supply are scattered. Uh, at a high density location, they usually have like one uh, only one and one entry and exit point for the cabs. And as a result, it's more like a queue. I mean, you cannot just enter from any other road. And similarly, the rider just cannot stand anywhere where he or she feels like. So, which makes it some kind of a, a queuing problem. And then the traditional, uh, you know, the product uh, does not take care of that. So, looking at all these things, we realize that maybe it's a it's the right use case to kind of you know be explored. And it, it is perhaps the right time because the ride hailing product is kind of mature. And if we don't find out, you know, such, uh, we, we don't empathize with such user or sub user pain points or needs, then we might not get an opportunity to kind of grow the product. And in this, with, with this kind of a market potential, the product is uh, sort of very high potential. And this can lead to something really disruptive and the growth can be disruptive from here onwards. And uh, and maybe it gives us an opportunity to look beyond incremental changes or incremental uh, you know, improvements in the existing product and do something big bang from for growth's sake. And I think that's the reason that we finally decided to kind of go ahead and build the first prototype. And it was a simple solution. And I think uh, this solution in some shape or form uh, you would have come across at airports around the world. I mean, in India as well, in Middle East as well as in US. Uh, but at the time of you know, I mean, building this, uh, a lot of other players were also started experimenting in some form or shape uh, on this. So the solution that we envisaged is that whenever you arrive at a high density location, and when I say arrived, it's mostly airport. But if you are at a high density location like a concert hall or a you know, football stadium or or so on. Um, you what you do is when you open up the app, instead of getting a dedicated driver, um, the rider gets um, an OTP in return. Okay, and it says clearly that with this OTP, you can just avail any cab uh, that you see in the queue. Uh, the best part is like for all the problems around Wi-Fi app and so on. Uh, we we created solutions for beyond the smartphone as well. So for users who have a feature phone can give a certain missed call and they will get the OTP in return um, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, so even for smartphone users who don't have the app or like no Wi-Fi connection, they can obviously take the missed call approach, uh, which does not take, uh, like, like you don't need a plan to kind of give a, uh, a missed call. Um, it's free of cost. And then with that OTP, what you do is you go to the pickup spot and there's a queue of, uh, you know, Kareem or for that matter, Uber cars queued up there. And then what you do is you sit in the first car, give the OTP and leave that premises, uh, you know, as quickly as possible. And it takes care of some of these problems that you have of the demand side on the, on the, on the, on the, uh, on the supply side and on the marketplace side. Um, I mean, I can go deeper into this product and then I can let you know that how we build, uh, you know, uh, sub products or features for the, for the, for the drivers, um, wherein we kind of, you know, showed them their queue number, their estimated wait time. And the fact that they're entering a queuing arena, wherein we have this FIFO method method of like whosoever comes in kind of goes out first. And those kind of capabilities came up on the, on the supply side of things. So that to kind of give them uh, some kind of a uh, predictability around when the next trip is coming around and how much is the wait time and the fact that they're in a queue gives them that assurance that once they have gotten in and they move forward, they know that it's going to kind of uh, come to them sequentially and not like in an abrupt manner wherein they don't have clarity 
around who gets the trip and hence with with all these things we could commit to a certain uh that wait time that the drivers would have at the platforms uh at at at, at these places so um yeah so in total i think uh, what we ended up building is a great uh product which actually ticked off really fast uh not just in in the in in uae but across the middle east and maybe the the features of the product kind of suited the kind of you know high density locations and user segments that we have here and then this actually gave us a huge round of growth to our uh, you know ride hailing product which obviously was at a mature stage uh, we continue to discover more such uh, you know uh, products for our ride hailing on a regular basis uh this is to say that we don't kind of ignore the mature product and we do build incremental improvements to it um and and um and the and the features that we build in are uh still quite useful i mean specific, uh, especially around the safety side of things and uh also i think uh, what we have done is like over a period of time kind of integrated the um the ride hailing with other product lines um around you know food groceries etc so i think most of the apps like uh, uber as well as kareeb has evolved into a super app kind of a thing wherein they kind of you know i mean base their their other services or other product lines around their mature product and they kind of use the users that are coming out of uh the the, the mature product to kind of you know uh make them spend further on some of the other product lines so you open up a curry map or an uber app you see that you have ride hailing but you have other services as well so that's also like one innovative way of growing the uh you know business based on your core product which you anticipate getting into a maturity what you do is like you have more uh, you have the existing users from there and make them exposed to other value propositions or needs right so whether it's getting the food at your doorstep or you going and kind of picking up the the food item quick groceries and especially with kareem i think they have gone further and kind of where you can get you know movie tickets pay off bills send money to from one user to another and so on so forth so using harnessing or leveraging the the ex, the user base of the mature product and kind of you know Uh, stretching further into some of these new product lines and providing this extra value to our users so uh i think that's pretty much it for from my end about how uh you can kind of try and grow your mature products um yeah so i think uh, please let me know how did it go and uh, i haven't done this kind of a session before so uh, i'll really appreciate your feedback and any uh other feedback that you have on the whole content and thank you so much uh it was great uh you know interacting with you thanks guys bye